All right, chapter six, here we go. Edwin Stanton continued his investigation as Abraham Lincoln slept his last deep sleep at the Peterson house. His brain was dead and beyond dreaming. By 4 a.m., Stanton was sure he was dealing with a conspiracy. The evidence found in Booth's hotel room included the mysterious Sam letter that seemed to predict the assassination. The recovery of this letter, which Booth had carelessly or perhaps on purpose let fall into the hands of the manhunters, was obviously addressed to the actor by an unknown conspirator. Stanton read it and recognized that it was full of clues. Booth had at least two conspirators named Sam and Mike. Sam was in Baltimore. The assassination was premeditated, planned before March 27th, and the Confederacy might be involved. At the Peterson house, a doctor recorded statistics in the notes he kept, tracking the sad and inevitable deterioration of Lincoln's condition that night. 5.50 a.m., respiration 28 and regular sleeping. Five, 6 o'clock a.m., pulse failing, respiration 28. 6.30 a.m., still failing and labored breathing. That's respiration would be 28 breaths per minute. At the Peterson house, Abraham Lincoln began death, the death struggle. The end was coming fast. Surgeon General Barnes placed his finger on the pulse in Lincoln's neck. Dr. Leo placed his finger on the pulse in Lincoln's wrist. Another doctor placed his hand over Lincoln's heart. The doctors and nearly every man in the room took watches out of their pockets. It was 7.20 a.m. April 15, 1865. More than once they had thought Lincoln had passed, but the strong body resisted death many times through the long night. Abraham Lincoln took his last breath. His heart stopped beating at 7.22 and 10 seconds. It was over. He is gone. He is dead, one of the doctors said. The occupants of the room stood silent and motionless for a few minutes. Edwin Stanton finally spoke. He asked Reverend Gurley, Lincoln's pastor, whether he would say a few words. I will speak to God, replied the minister. Let us pray. He summoned up a very moving prayer, then murmured amen. Stanton broke the silence. Now he belongs to the angels. Stanton reached for pen and paper and wrote a single sentence. There was nothing else to say. It was a telegram that would transmit the sad news to the nation. Washington City, April 15th, 1865. Major General Dixon, New York. Abraham Lincoln died this morning at 22 minutes after 7 o'clock. Edwin M. Stanton. Reverend Gurley and Lincoln's eldest son, Robert, told Mary the news. She would not go to the room where Lincoln had died. She could not bear it. She never saw her husband's face again. Around 9 a.m., she left the Peterson house for the White House. The room was empty of all visitors except Edwin Stanton. The morning light streaming through the back window crossed Lincoln's face. Stanton closed the blinds, took a small knife or pair of scissors from his pocket, and bent over Lincoln's body. Gently, he cut a generous lock of hair and sealed it in a plain white envelope. Stanton signed his name in ink on the envelope, then addressed the envelope to Mrs. Wells. The memento was not for him, but for Mary Jane Wells, wife of the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, one of Mary Todd Lincoln's few friends in Washington. In 1862, she had helped nurse Willie Lincoln, ill with typhoid fever, until his death. Afterward, she did double, double duty, nursing Tad Lincoln and caring for Mrs. Lincoln, helpless in her grief. Shortly thereafter, the Wells' own young son died of diphtheria. With that event, Mary Jane Wells and Mary Todd Lincoln shared a loss that brought them even closer to each other. Stanton knew that if any person in Washington deserved a precious lock of the martyr's hair, it was Mary Jane Wells. Her late, she later framed the cherished relic with dried flowers that had decorated Abraham Lincoln's coffin at the White House funeral. Stanton gazed, gazed down at his fallen chief and wept. And this is just a picture of a newspaper article from the Daily Citizen. It was time to take Lincoln home. Stanton ordered soldiers to transport the president back to the executive mansion. The men arrived with a plain pine box. It looked like a shipping crate, not a proper coffin for a head of state. Lincoln would not have minded. He had always been a man of simple tastes. This was the plain coffin of a rail, this was the plain coffin of a rail splitter. The, Lincoln, the soldiers wrapped Lincoln in an American flag. They placed him in the box, screwed down the lid. The only sound in the room was the squeaking of the screws being tightened in the holes. The soldiers carried the coffin into the street and loaded it into the back of a simple horse-drawn wagon. The driver snapped the reins and the modest parade escorted him by a small group of bareheaded officers on foot. Took Abraham Lincoln to the White House. 
there were no bands, drums, or trumpets, just the beat of the hooves and the footsteps of the officers. Lincoln would have liked the simplicity. This is the, like the official notice of his death. Vice President Andrew Johnson was not president when Lincoln died, so the cabinet sent him an official notification of the president's death and of his succession to the presidency. Johnson agreed to take the oath of office at 11 a.m. in his hotel room at the Kirkwood House. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Salmon Chase, or Salmon, I'm not really sure how to say that, S-A-L-M-O-N, and the cabinet members found Johnson grave, dignified, and deeply moved. Given the tragic and unique circumstances of his elevation to the presidency, it was decided that it would not be appropriate for him to deliver a formal inaugural address. Though John Surratt was being sought by, the, by Stanton as one of Lincoln's assassins, he was not even in Washington on April 14th. Instead, he was in Elmira in upstate New York. The morning Lincoln died, John Surratt heard the news of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Afraid that his name might be connected with Booth's, he fled to Canada. Then he decided that fleeing to Europe offered him the best chance of survival. In Rome, Italy, he joined the Pope's army and eluded capture for a whole year. In Maryland, Lieutenant David Dana of the 13th New York Cavalry followed leads he'd received from informants. Unfortunately, he was pursuing the kind of false leads that would come to haunt the manhunts in the days ahead. Little more than an hour before Lincoln died, George Azarot rose from his humble room at the Pennsylvania house and left the hotel. As Azarot walked along Booth's escape route, just two blocks from Ford's theater, he tossed his knife under a wood carriage step into the gutter. A few minutes later, a sharp-eyed woman looking out the third-story window in the building across the street saw it there. The clue, still in its sheath, was taken to the chief of police. From New York City came the offer of help. Twelve hours after Stanton had asked his chief of police to send its finest detectives to Washington to help track the president's killer, Stanton also summoned Lieutenant Lafayette Baker, one of his favorites, to leave New York for Washington. The executive branch of the government, Vice President Johnson, and the cabinet had survived the night. No other assassinations had occurred. No invading rebel army stormed the Capitol. Secretary Stanton attempted to coordinate the efforts of the local police force, detectives, and the army. Booth and his conspirators had to be caught before they vanished into the deep south where they would find aid and comfort in the heart of the Confederacy. At the farm, Dr. Mudd's wife, Frances, rose early, called for her servants to prepare breakfast, and woke her husband. After two hours of sleep, David Harold walked downstairs and joined the Mudds for breakfast, while a servant carried breakfast upstairs for Booth. Booth, his mind and body still exhausted from the great day, stayed in bed. He was too far from Washington to hear the ringing bells of the city's churches tolling in the morning. As he made casual conversation at the breakfast table, Harold appeared unaware of the danger he faced. He was running for his life, but seemed to the Muds not to have a care in the world. He asked for a razor so that he could shave and asked Dr. Mudd if he could make a pair of crutches for Booth. Mudd fashioned a crude pair out of a piece of plank and sent them up to Booth. By 8 o'clock a.m., George Azarot had walked to Georgetown on the way to his cousin's house. He showed up at Matthew and Company's store and paid a call on an acquaintance. He tried to raise some money, first by selling his watch, then by using his revolver as collateral for a $10 loan. Azarot left the store with the money and continued his journey. He would leave Washington. He knew a place where he thought he would be safe. At the executive mansion, the soldiers carried the president in his temporary coffin to the second floor of, for an autopsy. Cutting open Abraham Lincoln's brain and the body served little scientific purpose. The surgeons already knew what had killed him, a single bullet through the brain. They hid their morbid curiosity behind a shield of scientific investigation. One surgeon reached for his saws and knives while the others watched, and they wanted the bullet. The nation could hardly bury its martyred father, Abraham, with a lead Abram, Abraham, sorry, <laughs> with a lead bullet lodged in his brain. They cut it out, marked it as evidence, and preserved it for history. His blood, according to a newspaper report, was drained from the corpse by an embalmer, transferred to glass jars, and preserved. When they were finished, Mary Todd Lincoln sent a request. Please cut off a link of his hair for her. Lock of his hair. With Dr. Mudd providing assistance and advice, Harold rode to Bryantown to find a buggy or carriage to transport Booth south. When they got within sight of the edge of town, Harold yanked back hard on the reins and brought his horse to a stop. He could not believe what he saw several hundred yards away. 
Mounted men wearing a uniform, Harold recognized Yankee cavalry, manhunters. Harold had just spotted the 13th New York Cavalry. Lieutenant Dana had led his troops to Bryantown, a well-known place of Confederate intrigue, commandeered the tavern and occupied the town. Dana intended to establish a command center there and from Bryantown launched cavalry patrols through the surrounding countryside in pursuit of Lincoln and Seward's assassins. They were just a few miles from Mudd's farm. This was the closest the pursuers had gotten to Booth since the assassination. Harold made a quick decision to get out of Bryantown before he could be spotted by the cavalry. He told Mudd he didn't need his carriage after all. Booth could ride a horse. Mudd was puzzled by the sudden change of plan. As Booth had not yet told Mudd he was Lincoln's assassin, Mudd continued to Bryantown at a relaxed pace, just as he had done on countless Saturday afternoons. He went about his business buying supplies, greeting friends and neighbors, and passed in the streets. But a strange, wild atmosphere hung over Bryantown. The cavalrymen's faces were angry. Mud wondered what had happened. And someone blurted it out. Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated in Washington last night. He died early this morning. The cavalry is here in pursuit of the assassin who escaped. Detectives and soldiers were searching the Maryland countryside, hunting the murderer. Most astonishing of all was who had done it. It was the actor, John Wilkes Booth. Mud remained calm and did not betray the secret known at this moment to him alone. America's most wanted man was hiding in his farmhouse less than five miles away. Harold rode to the farm to warn Booth. When he arrived, Booth was still in bed, and he wouldn't be, but he wouldn't be for long. The cavalry is here, Harold warned. They are just down the road in Bryantown. It was 3 p.m. Saturday, April 15th, and Booth, Booth was in grave danger. Only Samuel, Samuel Mudd stood between him and disaster. Mudd had the power to end the manhunt for Lincoln's killer that afternoon. All he had to do was tell the soldiers that John Wilkes Booth and his accomplice were hiding in his farm. He could tell them Booth had broken his leg. He cannot run away. He could take them to Booth right now. All he had to do was tell them, and Dr. Samuel, Samuel A. Mudd would become instantly a national hero. Booth faced the difficult choice of what to do next. If the doctor had betrayed him to the troops in Bryantown, Booth was a dead man. If they did not kill him on the spot at Mudd's farm, then they would es escort their captured prey back to Washington for a hanging. Instead of fleeing the farm immediately, they waited for the doctor's return. After 6 p.m., Mudd finally rode down the main road and made the turn toward the farm. He was alone and brought no cavalry. Booth's judgment of Mudd's character had been correct. He had not betrayed them. Mudd could not hide his distress. He ordered Booth and Harold to leave his farm at once. Ignoring Mudd's anger, Booth focused on the priceless news the doctor had brought back from town. The president was dead and fame was his. Less than 24 hours after the assassination, Dr. Mudd had just given Booth the first confirmation that he had killed Lincoln. Booth might rejoice at the news of the tyrant's death, but Mudd was angry and afraid. By coming there, Booth had placed Mudd and his entire family in great danger. Yes, Mudd had agreed to help Booth with the kidnapping of Abraham Lincoln, but no one had consulted him about the murder. Now, by offering Booth his hospitality, he had unknowingly made himself an accomplice in the most shocking crime in all of American history, the murder of the President of the United States. Mudd continued to insist that Booth and Harold leave the farm at once, but he was sympathetic to the assassin's situation. He was no fan of Abraham Lincoln, the Union, or Black people. Booth had made... Booth may have involved him and abused his hospitality, but not enough to make Mudd betray him. Mudd agreed that as long as they left immediately, he would help the assassins. He would not return to Bryantown and report Booth's whereabouts. He would hold his tongue and allow Booth a head start. If the soldiers came to question him, he would say that only, only that two strangers in need of medical assistance stopped briefly at his farm. Then he would send the man hunters in the wrong direction. Mudd gave Booth the names of two trustworthy local Confederate operatives, William Buttles, Bertles, and Captain Samuel Cox. Then Mudd explained the route to take the route to the next stop on their underground rebel railroad. They must travel southeast in a wide arc to avoid troops in Bryantown. About two miles south, they would find the Bertles place. Cox Farm was several miles further southwest. From there, they would be close to the Potomac River. Mudd also gave Booth the name of the doctor and the name of a doctor on the Virginia side in case his leg continued to trouble him. David helped Booth climb onto his horse and handed him the crude crutches Mudd made for him. Mudd, relieved by their leaving, watched them ride off until they vanished from sight. 
It was around 7 p.m., 15 hours since the assassin had arrived at Mudd's door and just 20 hours since John Wilkes Booth had shot the president. As dusk faded to dark darkness, Booth and Harold continued south, careful to watch for signs of cavalry. The pair had a long night's ride ahead of them, but they had survived the first day undetected. Although Mudd had shown Booth the route they must take, Booth and Harold got lost. They were fortunate to come upon a local man, Oswell Swan, half black, half Piscataway, who for $7 agreed to take them directly to Captain Cox's place. Oswald Swan earned his pay that night. He guided them safely through the Zakaya Swamp with muck, snakes, and wild overgrown vegetation to the doorstep of Captain Samuel Cox. It was after midnight on April 16th, Easter Sunday.